Welcome to the third episode of Vista Mall 2020 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who, according to the older ladies of Vernon, British Columbia, threatens to form a slutty bond most evenings, Logan Saunders. Good morning. <laughs> Do you want to know what Ben's one would have been if he joined us? Because <laughs> it's the uh, most brutal one I've ever done. <laughs> what would it have been? And the Australian who spends most of his evenings looking for K and penises with STDs, Benjamin Powell. <laughs> Oh, that's why he didn't show up today. Yeah, that's why he didn't show up. <laughs> so, how are you doing, anyway? Uh, I fly out to India tomorrow. Yeah, I kind of realised after editing both of the previous two episodes that we've not continued the running joke of where in the world is Logan Saunders. And, you know, next week that actually will be a genuine question. Yeah, for the next two weeks, I believe. I think the next two recordings, one will... Well, I guess both recordings will be in the Philippines, but one will be... Just after India, and then just before I come back here. Here being Canada, in case the listeners don't know that. <laughs> and there isn't long until Where in the World is Logan Saunders is going to be a regular occurrence. Because you've not got long till you go travelling again. Uh, most people's version of not long. <laughs> <laughs> not long to normal human beings. Yeah. So, this episode I hear was sponsored by the World Health Organization this week. There was a lot of dick references. Yeah. A lot of penis uh, references, exactly. And talking of people being really, really fucked, Yika went home. <laughs> My number one pick. Oh, the unbridled joy I felt when I got it spoiled that Yika went home. I rarely get defeated when it comes to suspecting people on the mole, but... When it happens, I hear it's delicious for a lot of people. Just the intense joy I got from editing the pool picture with my team being complete, your number one being gone, Michelle's number one being gone. Oh, chef's kiss. You know whose turn it is next, though, right? Yeah, in theory, but also, your team is screwed. I said, How is it screwed? Well, who do I have? I said this to Bindles, because um, Bindles was the one who accidentally told me that Yaka went home this week. Uh, I said this to Bindles a couple of days ago and said, Saunders is absolutely fucked because he has Clayce, who is 100% not the mole, and Johan, who is 100% not the mole. Uh, Clayce could be the mole. Clayce is not the mole. <laughs> I don't know. Don't kid yourself, Saunders. So, speaking of, like, dicks and penises in the season we've now lost a woman three rounds in a row we have and the remaining two are both quite suspicious so something tells me a guy is going home next week well, what if a guy doesn't go home next week then bye bye leone probably this has been the trend in a lot of recent seasons that the male players make a make a deep run yeah and i don't know why because all of the casting on vidum tends to be quite good but the the women do tend to fall very quickly now. Like, cause I guess that happens more so in the Belgian version, where we actually did have an all-male final three just within the past couple of years. I'm pretty sure Vidim hasn't had a an all-male final three for a while. Well, the odds are very good this year. The odds are, but also, if, as let's be honest, we suspect Belushka is the mole, then... It guarantees there will not be an all-male final three. Yeah, depend and if she's not the mole, hopefully she has created a lot of slutty bonds to get her through. I also love how she becomes the first person ever to have three references in three podcasts for your intros. <laughs> You've literally just had Malushka quotes all season so far. Malushka shaping my persona on Vidim. And it wasn't even deliberate this week. I was actually actively trying to find a quote that was not a Malushka one this week, and I went, nah, I've got to go with Slutty Bonds. I've never heard of a coalition referred to as a Slutty Bond. To be fair, most James Bonds can be counted as Slutty Bonds. Especially Pierce Brosnan. So anyway, previously, the candidates set off fireworks from Bridge, but the team of three failed to succeed, raising suspicions. Buddy and Milushka initiated a room switch for more information before everyone went on a taxi tour, and Tina got lost. And in the final challenge, they had to compile a map of mole locations, but at the execution, Michelle's first pick of Tina was for nothing as she went home. Absolutely nothing. 
And after Tina's departure, everyone else took the bullet train to Shangshu, the capital of the Henan province. And the episode title means prosperous or good at sailing. I like how it has those two alternate meanings. Yeah, it's a Dutch idiom, I'm assuming. And speaking of words that start with idiom, uh, they don't do too well on this first challenge. This hovercraft puzzle really kills them. It's even worse that they work out the solution, they just can't work out how to do the switches to make it work. Much like the problem in our own fantasy pool. Well, yeah, because I'm very surprised we've got three weeks in and nobody's used a switch yet. I was saying this to to Michelle uh, earlier. She's like, you know I'm not going to use it even though you want me to. What happens if I switch out Johan? Is there a scenario where I get Johan back? Yeah, you could get him back because we could, me or Michelle could switch him right back at you. Oh, so if I like switch somebody with Michelle, Michelle can just switch back Johan? In theory. She might not. But in theory, she could. It's the risk you have to take. And given that we've probably only got about three weeks left of the switches being active, we all need to start thinking about who we're going to use ours on. Because I have someone in mind who I'm going to use mine on when the time's right. Can it be like a two-for-one trade for mine? (laughs) We're not taking Clayson and and Johan off you, despite what you seem to want. (laughs) Not unless you're really lucky. Not unless you can convince Michelle that Johan's the mole. <laughs> no one is really that silly at challenges. No, it's all <laughs> definitely calculated. All a ruse. So Rick meets Buddy and Malushka by the Yellow River, and they can make money while riding between stops where their fellow candidates will be waiting. And if they're all in the right spots after an hour, they earn 2,250 euros for the pots. And each hovercraft stops at every stop three times and then goes back to the harbour. There's a maximum of five candidates allowed per hovercraft. And at every stop, they've got to swap out at least one person. Each person has another who they can't be on the same hovercraft as, which is Leone and Johan, obviously, because they'd ruin the challenge. Rob and Yaika, Milishka and Clace, and Buddy and Nathan. And everyone else waits at the first stop. And at the first stop, there is a board with more rules, which is in lines one and two. There should be three people each. And Rob and Buddy belong together. And at the second stop, there's another board, which is that Leone and Yaiku can't go together. Nathan and Clace are on line two. And Buddy is not on line one, but Milushka is. And yeah, this is the sort of challenge that we can't really recap very well, I'll be honest. It's a lot of people switching, but they mess it up. And as Yaiku said, they cracked the puzzle in the first round, but they still have to execute it correctly. Yeah, Buddy has it all figured out, it seems. Yeah, like he was a his airtime just went way up this week. He makes the slutty bond with Malushka, and then they he just has this whole challenge figured out. But no one can really follow the pattern. And next thing you know, they drop off Leone and Clace, and half a second later, Leone realizes, oh, for the fifth challenge in a row, I have messed up. Well, my first comment of the entire episode was just, Buddy is narrating this entire season now. We seem to get Buddy's perspective a lot this season. And usually when you get one person's perspective frequently, they are never the mole. But I'm hoping in this case they might be because Buddy is in my team. Right. But yeah, just that classic, the hovercraft slowly pulling away. And we always like, well, this challenge is lost. And shot Gaspar, it is. Rick said they started off well, but it was a mess. And they earn no euros for the pots. It's like answering the question, but not handing your paper up to the front of the class to the teacher. Instead, you turn into a paper airplane and you throw it into the garbage. That's essentially what they did with this challenge. They had the solution, but like, eh, let's just, eh, we don't, we don't, we don't need the, we don't need the euros. We're going to try and break last year's record. We don't want to enter five digits. Well, they are on pretty much a par with last year at this point. After three episodes, I I think... Last year we're on somewhere on about three and a half thousand euros, and they're on three thousand six hundred and seventy by the end of this episode. It was all because of that cup challenge. That was a prime opportunity to like trade in for that suitcase and have it only be worth like two hundred euros. It was, but we'll get there. So the correct solution was that Yaika, Johan, and Milushka should have been in line one. Clayce, Leonie, and Nathan should have been in line two, and Buddy and Rob should have been in line three. And Everin bickers over who was responsible, and then we get the slutty bond being formed. Who was responsible? Well, I think we can say that Buddy wasn't responsible. But with this sort of a challenge, it doesn't matter if you have the solution, 
if you then don't work out the actual way to get to the solution. My theory is that what the mole did on this challenge was that they just did not provide any input on how to help. Like, oh, no one else is really figuring out how to transport everybody to the finish line. If I just say nothing, then that means we don't win. If they say, hey, I'm going to go off on t- jump out of the hovercraft at this random spot. You know what? I'm going to jump out of this hovercraft at this random spot and we don't get any money. The way that the mole easily wins this is just make sure that two people are wrong. That's all they have to do, because if one person is wrong, it's far too suspicious. If two people are wrong, then something's gone wrong along the way. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was there was some definite moling going on there. Oh, definitely. And I'm just not sure whether it was the mole being apathetic or whether the mole was just going, nah, I don't need to actually intervene. They're doing it wrong anyway. Yeah. So Rob and Malishka do form an internship or a slutty bond. And he feels that she's one of the most important players in the game. He says he's not the mole, but she refuses to confirm or deny that she isn't. And she says that they will share information occasionally, just not necessarily the right information. What a strong alliance. What a strong coalition. I've never seen a two-person bond on the mole with so much distrust. Like, what are you accomplishing? (laughs) Neither of them trust each other, but neither of them are each other's top suspects. So they're like, yeah, we'll have to work together under duress. A begrudging alliance. And in the second challenge, they meet Rick at a park overlooked by huge stone heads. And it's the square of Emperor Yan and Huang. And at 160 metres high, they are some of the highest stone sculptures in the world. At four of the 107 statues in the park, there are envelopes with money, which total 2,000 euros for the pot. And Rick begins by asking for two people with a sharp eye for detail and six with imagination. As a mole, would you want to be with the eye for detail or imagination teams? I'd be in that larger imagination team. Because that's where the chaos is. Yeah, a lot of the the descriptions are a bit ambiguous, even though, to be fair to the Milushka and Clace were very good with the descriptions. A lot of them could go for more than one statue, and with the rule that they couldn't backtrack, then yeah, it makes it a lot easier for the ball to win. Yeah, because you just misinterpret and say, oh, they said this, they said this, the thing is here, the thing is here. And everyone else is like, oh yeah, that is what they said. And it almost becomes like a sort of uh, Mandela effect. So it is Milushka and Klaus who are the two that are picked with an eye for detail, and they've got pictures of the statues with money and half an hour to describe them to everyone else. And they can only take four envelopes. If they take the wrong ones, they could take minus money for the pot. And they are split into two groups, Yika, Nathan and Leone, and Buddy, Rob and Johan. When when they talk about the Stoneheads, I'm surprised Nathan wasn't one of the Stoneheads. Is that a weed joke? Yes. <laughs> 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 ah, Canada, never change. <laughs> You're so proud of yourself. <laughs> oh, I was thinking of stone heads. Stone ah, heads. Ah, that makes sense. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so Yika, Nathan, and Leone find the first envelope, and Leone tries to run off, but you can't run back once you've passed one. And then Yika gets frustrated and tells the other team to stop being obsessed with the book one when they've already got it. That's where some mulling was attempted to happen. Yeah, the thing is, even if she hadn't gone home this week, you knew for certain that Yaika was not the mole, given how fanatical she was this episode. Yeah, she turns a complete 180, and then at the end, when they're saying their farewell, not farewell Williams, when they're saying their farewell, you're happy. <laughs> they're all saying, man, we would not have as half as much money if it wasn't for Yaika, or we wouldn't have any money if it wasn't for Yaika. I'm like, where did this? Where was this at in the past two episodes? Why is she suddenly just the hero, the fallen hero this week? And if that's the case, then their chances of winning money in future challenges is not looking too bright. Yeah, but if you go back to my suspicion of who was going to go home last week, which was Clace, I said that we'll probably know whether Clace is going to go home this week or not, because if he gets a massive spike in airtime, he's going. And what do you know, Yaika apparently is the saviour of the entire park. She gets a huge edit this week. We get a huge amount of information that she is definitely not the mole, and then she goes home. And as we'll find out in the next challenge, the only person who wants to save the pot is Nathan. And I also love that the envelopes are just attached to the statues with duct tape. They couldn't even come up with a proper 
proper easy way to do it. It was just attached to duct tape. Now there's these statues that are thousands of years old that have like these duct tape markings on it. It's like the equivalent to saying like, uh, Adam was here and was is spelled W U Z. It's basically duct tape graffiti. They should have spelled out words on the statue and duct tape. Yeah, but then it would have spelled out who the mole was. That's true. That would have been a, been a hidden clue. A hidden clue that the mole would have had to duct. And Nathan says that in every assignment, there's always time to look at your surroundings and take them in. And he loves looking at the history of the place. Nathan seems really nice. He doesn't seem like a guy who wants to sabotage the group on a day-to-day basis. Oh no, you can pretty much rule him out. He's slightly more suspicious than, say, Johan and Clace, but it's not much above that. I have already done my Bothers Bar suspect list this week, and my bottom three were in order. Nathan, Clace, Johan. And they'll be your final three. Nah. I would be very surprised if any of those three are the mole. And the best thing is, I have none of those people in my team, so I can say this. I want you to lose the next three people in your team over the next three weeks just for that remark. I know you do, but also, the thing is, switches are active till Final Five. I'm guaranteed now to have someone in at Final Five. There is no guarantee that... There's no guarantee that one of you two could have anyone in your team left by Final Five now. Anyways, uh, anything else to really say about this stoner head challenge? Uh, no, I mean, the first envelope's minus 50 euros, second's 400, third's 500, and the last one's minus 250, giving them a total of 600 euros out of a possible 2,000 for this challenge. And on the bus ride to the final challenge of the episode, they do elect a new treasurer, because nobody trusts Johan anymore. Because Johan said, man, we have going into the final challenge of the episode, he said, hey guys, we've won a lot of money. It's like, isn't that probably pretty much the lowest amount of money in a pot after the first three episodes, other than, say, Vidim, Georgia? Yeah, I was going to say I was gonna say Georgia didn't get positive until episode four, I think. Vidim, Georgia, yeah, they still owed money to, uh, to art. And I've mentioned this in both of the previous two episodes, but the theme this season seems to be nostalgia. And whilst there wasn't any outward nostalgia this time, there was an old mole music piece that played behind Rick introducing the third challenge. And I only know it because it is an iconic piece of music in the mall. It's called Looking for Clues from the Godzilla soundtrack from about 1998. And they also had uh, the porcelain used in this to celebrate the porcelain anniversary. See, they did, and I thought that, but I actually didn't have that written down for the first um, from the first episode notes because I genuinely, when watching this episode yesterday, went, I'm going to double-check what wedding present porcelain actually is it is not the 20th no porcelain is the 18th 18th that's such an odd number well it's an even number but you know what i mean yeah it's such a weird number because 20 is actually platinum is it different in dutch culture traditionally the 20th anniversary was celebrated with china but in modern days the official gift is platinum they celebrate with china and china well that that's obviously the reference they're going for but nowadays it's celebrated with platinum and 18 is actually porcelain Harmstone out. Does that apply to Dutch culture too? They just say they don't just say screw porcelain. No, I would assume so. Yeah. Screw Moby. Yeah. But looking for clues is probably the piece of music outside of Eratio, which is the theme music that has been used in them all the most. It was very interesting to hear it again. Uh, so Milishka says that her and Buddy have a secret bond here, and they want to keep an eye on Leone, Nathan, and Johan. One of them will have to room with one of those three, and one will have to do the assignment with one of those three to try and rule them out. And she also says that if Buddy is the mole, she's really, really, really fucked. Really? And the final challenge of the episode takes place in Shenhu village on day six, and they are being served tea when Rick arrives. Apparently it's the capital of porcelain, which is actually the 18th wedding present, and he shows them a tea set. And the contents are going to be spread out across the town using clues. They have 30 minutes to find the pieces, and have to work in pairs. And there is a maximum of 2,700 euros for the pops in this challenge, which was not actually said to them. I wonder if the full name of the village is Zen Who is the Mall. And Rob and Leone, Nathan and Buddy, Milushka and Johan, and Clayson and Yaika are paired up, and Clayson and Yaika also have a third card. And Leone says it's good to pair it with Rob, because he's easily distracted and she can mole around him. And the clues are the names in Chinese of the nine shops with the pieces in them. And if they've solved it, they find the piece in the shop. 
At least the team was smart enough to not pair Leone and Johan together. Because otherwise, bad things happen, as we discussed last week. It's like having a bull in the china shop. And hands down, the funniest quote of the entire episode is Buddy in the next bit. Because he says that he wants to know what the shop names mean, but he'd have to leave it, or Google it, but you can't in China. Long story. <laughs> Long story. <laughs> I remember last year when I was traveling during Chinese New Year through Asia, and that's when a lot of like the American and Canadian school teachers in China also get time off, so they take off for like two or three weeks. So I'd run in, into some of them, and I remember this one specific guy where he has, because a lot of them will spend the money to have that to have a VPN, Express VPN, or there's I guess there's a bunch of really good ones out there now. But I guess you have to pay good money for it to be able to use in China to have access to Google and stuff. And uh, then he was telling me about this. I'm like, oh, what, what, what are all the apps that you, what are all the apps that we use that you can't use in China? And he's like, I'm not going through the list again. Yeah, Google, Facebook, Twitter, they're the main three. But you don't actually realize how difficult it is not having Google Maps to get around a foreign city until you're in China. What did you use to get around China? Um. Well, we didn't really, is the honest answer. We Luckily, we had a tour guide for two of the three days we were in Beijing. So he, he took care of the navigation, and I kind of wish we would have had um, actual maps from you know the debacle that was getting to the cruise ship at the end. But on the first day, it was genuinely so alien, and I think that contributed to the discomfort that I felt in Beijing was the fact that genuinely, if I'd got lost, I would have had no chance of getting back. Absolutely not. Because obviously there's no... No English street signs or no recognisable Western characters on the street signs. You can't use Google Maps, and the best you can do really is try and save a, a map offline, but that's not going to work. Did you have Maps Stop Me on your phone? No, but like even the even the open source maps in China aren't necessarily accurate, and we found weren't accurate at all because you can't have the satellites go over. Oh, they they have all that blocked? Yeah, everything's blocked. So it's really weird trying to get around without all that sort of stuff. Is Hong Kong the same way? No, Hong Kong's completely different. It's night and day because, for example, as you well know, on my phone contract, you've got roaming internationally in quite a few countries, and it was very helpful for you when you are travelling around Europe. But Hong Kong is one of the many places I can use my, my data, and China 100% isn't. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's crazy that a country of like 1.5 billion people can be uh, so isolated from the technology that the rest of us use and take for granted. Yeah, it it really is genuinely probably going to be the most alien place I've ever been because of that sort of stuff. And I know I'm just sounding like first world problems. You couldn't use your phone in China, but you don't realize how much you rely on having Google Maps, for example, until you 100% cannot use it. And there's no Wi-Fi you can use it with. I can vouch for that. It's like a solo backpacker where it's like, where it saved me so many times trying to find really obscure addresses and on busy streets for a lot of the Airbnbs that I've used around the world. It's between Google Maps and Maps.me. It's, it's ridiculous what you can have set up on there. And you don't even have to ask anybody for help or risk getting exposed to scams or getting into any sort of dangerous situations. You can just self navigate on your own. Like, I was able to use that all around Japan, which, oh, I mean, Japan's not the easiest place to navigate. At least with Japan, everyone is really friendly. Yes, they will help you. It's just the communication barrier is is still very, very much alive <laughs> Without if you don't have your phone. The funniest thing for me when I was traveling around, around Asia was when we were in Ho Chi Minh City the first time, and we were sat in a KFC getting Wi-Fi off them because um, our phone contracts hadn't got Vietnam anymore. They now have. It's great. I can use. I could use my mobile web the last time I was in Vietnam. But we sat there and, like, being a proper English tourist, just going, could you, could you give me the Wi-Fi password? And she just grabbed my phone, did it, glared at me and walked off. <laughs> like, she didn't tell me what it was. She just did it. And... Really? <laughs> yeah. The glare and everything. I guess Ho Chi Minh City's where a lot more tourists go. Maybe they're just sick of tourists down there. It's like Barcelona. Almost certainly. And that's not a knock on Vietnam. Vietnam's one of the coolest places I've ever been. But that just did make me laugh. Over-tourism. 
So, Johan says that Milushka is looking for a letter K and also a penis with an STD. Sorry, a mushroom. What sort of a penis do you think you have, Johan? You should get that checked out, Johan. I know you can't actually use any data or anything in, in China, but I wouldn't be surprised if when Johan got home he had a text waiting from the STD clinic going, come see us, please, immediately. You seem to think your dick looks like a mushroom. That's a whole different version of Super Mario Brothers that I played. <laughs> wow! <laughs> you number one! <laughs> oh no, he has to jump onto the pole. No, the other pole! Let's go! <laughs> wow! <laughs> you know what makes this ten times better? The fact that out of the corner of my eye I can see the signed Charles Martinet picture I have on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Him just kind of glaring at me going, why are you referencing Mario characters having STDs? <laughs> oh, no! Mario! <laughs> Insert Luigi noises here. Yeah, Johan needs a cup for the cup challenge if that's the condition that he has. And Clayson and Yika quickly find the first door, but inspect the cup, because this is Vidim. Needs his Vatek liked. And Buddy asks in a shop for help, and Nathan suspects that he's stalling. And then Milushka and Johan find their cup, and there's is the first to go in the box. And Johan says that the box is moleproof. And Clay and Yika put the second piece in. And then Leone suggests that she runs back to the box to put the cup in, leaving Rob all alone and thinking she's moling. And then another wonderful Buddy moment happens when he speaks two sentences of Chinese, so he feels confident enough to babble Dutch at a poor lady in a shop. And the reason that this is the best is because our banner this week is Nathan just grinning at her when she has no idea, A, who he is, B, what he's saying. <laughs> because it made me giggle. It's a tonal language, buddy. It was just the sheer confusion and him just going, I'm going to smile through the pain of having no idea what she's saying. This is when, uh, as an ESL teacher, this is when I would say that TPR would be very effective. Yeah, but we saw TPR last week, and it did not end well. Well, that was because it was poor TPR. Effective TPR means you can communicate effectively with, with students who have a very minimal grasp of English. And also, if you ask Johan about TPR, he probably will think that the P stands for penis. TPR is what I just got diagnosed with. I got diagnosed with a very bad case of TPR. I'm sorry, sir, you've got TPR. You're going to have to have antibiotics. That's how the first male contestant is going to be eliminated from the season. It's not going to be because of a quiz. It's going to be medical evacuation after a diagnosis of TPR. Interestingly, there's barely been any medivacs in uh, Vidim history. Just the guy from the Georgia season who couldn't sleep? Yeah, well, there was Jean-Marc, who you thought was your mole after week one, can I point out, quitting because he didn't because he just didn't sleep because of the paranoia. And then there was a uh, an actual medical evacuation in uh, in an earlier season. Oh, yeah, J Japan. Was one in Japan? Oh, yeah, there was. I forgot about the Japan one, yeah. Um, there was the, the Japan one where someone just missed one and a half episodes, and then there was one between those two, which was um, in a cliff jumping game, someone's uh, spine got a little bit compressed. Ooh. Yeah, not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, Buddy and Nathan decide to take a cup from the box to show the woman in the shop and as, as an example. Johan tries to stop him, and they all go as a four to the store. And Leone says, it's far too easy. There's got to be a catch. This is Vias de Mole. And then Buddy and Nathan leave Milushka and Johan to help with their first one while they run for the second one. Yiker calls Clay to Johan by accident, because everyone seems to have Johan and his dick on their mind. Johan and Milushka take a joke from the store, but Leone doubts that it matches. And Johan manages to get it in the box just in time before Rick confirms that it's the correct one. And then they have a choice to make. I like how there was only, even though this was considered an easy challenge, this group still only passes it by three seconds. Oh yeah, definitely. So they have a choice, which is either take the 1500 euros, which the set is worth, or gamble on the value of the box. And anyone who knows what the value of this challenge is knows exactly what they should have done, and they did the exact opposite, because the value of the box was 2,700 euros. How did we find that out? A, it was the value of the entire challenge you saw on the screen. B, Rick confirmed it on Instagram last night. Oh, right, because they said it was worth 2,700. And this, was, this I guess, would probably put a lot of suspicion on Nathan. 
Yeah, it definitely would, because in this position, the mole 100% knows that they should not go for the box under any circumstance. So you have to then pay attention to who was going for the cash. Who did go for the cash? Nathan? I think it was Nathan, Rob, Clayson, and someone else. I can't remember who. But it wasn't abundantly clear, annoyingly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame that the contestants themselves weren't told, hey, you messed up, dumbasses. So yeah, they earned 1,500 euros of a possible 2,700 for this challenge, which means that they've earned 2,100 euros out of a possible 6,950 for the episode, and 3,670 of, as Rick says at the execution, 17,800 for the season so far. And it is now time for the test and execution. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home, except for the mole, who can never go home. Leone says that it's unbearable. As soon as you relax, it starts back up again. Yaika has a list, and she can't spread over four moles, so she has to reduce it to only two. Otherwise, she's out. And her mole was on the hovercraft. And Nathan suspected Tina last time, and he's going to eliminate who it's not now. Milushka says she was confident in the first two tests, and now not so much. Johan's going to spread on Milushka, Leone, Buddy, and Rob. Nathan still suspects Milushka despite befriending her. Milushka doesn't think that it's Clay or Yaika, and it could be any of the rest. Rob suspects Buddy, Leone, Milushka, or Johan, and says that Buddy is an actor, and actors are hard to read. And Clay needs to be careful of getting tunnel vision. He's tunnel visioning hard on Buddy. Buddy's day one suspicion was Leone, she barely brings anything into the pot, and he says he isn't going for Clays, Yaika, or Milushka. And Leone suspects Buddy because he tried his best in the beginning, but is now making mistakes. And that is a bloody long list of suspicions. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> and Rick says at the execution that they're doing badly, but the majority of the trip is still ahead for most of these people. And Milushka, Clayson, and Johan get green screens before Logan's first pick, and I'm still being incredibly smug about this, of Yika gets eliminated. Poor Yika. Poor Yika. She was so enthusiastic. She was so... Fanatical. Fanatical. Fanatic. She was so... Not the mole. And I will cast your mind back to week one when I said picking Yika was stupid because she's not the mole. You know what? Things, there's tough times right now between the volcano in the Philippines, the coronavirus in China, the death of Kobe Bryant, and now the execution of my number one pick on a reality TV show. And which of those is the worst, Logan? Well... Which of those hurts the world most? Is it the volcano, the coronavirus, Kobe Bryant dying in a helicopter crash, or your suspects going home? Can I use the 50-50 reaches? <laughs> You can phone a friend. Stop being selfish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, Yiker is gone. We're down to seven. I assume a non-elimination is right around the corner. Well, we have to have a non-elimination in the next three weeks. We have to use all of our switches in probably the next three weeks. They don't tend to have the the only non-elimination at Final Four, because, you know, there's barely anyone to carry the entire season. So I would assume next week or the week after, without knowing anything. So I guess i got to update my top three suspects. Yeah, so who do you suspect, Logan? I'm very excited to hear this, because last week you said it was Yaika. <laughs> so Malushka is now bumped up to the top. I have Rob as my number two. And number three, I keep going back and forth between Leone or Clays. Interesting. I don't think it's Johan. Again, the hair alone makes me rule out Nathan. And who's the one person I haven't mentioned? Buddy, yeah. Buddy was too much a, came off too much as a hero uh, this week. So I'm still going for Milushka as my model. Mm -hmm. My order roughly off the top of my head, is Milushka, Buddy, Leone, then Rob, Nathan, Clay, Johan. And I'm very impressed I managed to do that in one go. <laughs> Impressive. I've not changed my opinions that much, because the thing is, even though Buddy got a big edit this week and a big kind of hero moment at the hovercraft, it still didn't work. And it's all well and good having... All of the information of this is how you do it, but unless everyone actually executes it and trusts you, it's for nothing. Money for nothing. Dire straits. They are in dire straits. 
So, next time, Johan smashes things, there is another hugely nostalgic challenge, and I will have a lot to say about that. The keys disappear, and the path of temptation returns, seemingly in conjunction with the test. Twists are coming! Yeah. So, do you think anyone's going to go home next week, and if so, who? I don't think anyone's going to go home next week. But if somebody were to go home, I could see it being Nathan. We know for a fact that there is a test next week. We just don't know whether it's um, whether it's going to be an execution, basically. So in the pool, as you might have picked up on the subtle hint of my gloating all episode, Logan lost his first team member. It was his number one suspicion. And in the past week, there have been no switches, which means we go into the final three weeks of the switches with all three still active. And I think it's probably going to go crazy at some point. <laughs> Who wants your hand? Please switch Michelle. Uh, please switch your Milushka with Johan just to annoy Michelle. Please, it'll be funny. Well, what if Johan's the mole? Oh, then it'll be the funniest mole maybe ever. All I want is Michelle's apoplectic reaction when she loses a proper mole suspect and gets Johan. <laughs> I gotta wait till after she loses her second one and then trade Johan for her last person. I'm just such a dick about this, I know, but it's really funny. I need Michelle to lose this year. I said this to her last week. I love her dearly, but she can't win this year. I'm determined. Oh, Have you got anything else to say? No, I think I'm good. As am I. So, thank you for listening to our Vs to Mole recap. We'll be back this time next week for another Mole Hunt. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or YouTube, all of which are RTV Warriors. Or you can email us at contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan's on Twitter at logsuperquacky, and I am MJ Harlstone. See you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next to flavoring. <laughs>